thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, and various coming events. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. Today, I'm getting back into talking about the Holy Spirit. Since the beginning of the year, many of my sermons have been about the Holy Spirit because I, I think a lot of people just don't know much about the Holy Spirit, right? And I'm entitling this the latter rain. What does that phrase mean to you guys? You, does anybody know what the latter rain is? A latter day anointing that's stronger as we go forth. Okay. Have is there anyone here that's never heard that phrase before? It's found in multiple places in the Bible, and we're going to look at most of those where it is found in the Bible. But yeah, I would say it's when when we read about the latter rain in the Bible, it talks about the former rain or the early rain and the latter rain. And the latter rain, I believe, is I think we've tapped into it a little bit, but we we aren't really flowing in it yet. Remember when Greg Moore was here, one thing he said, I think he said it more than once, is that we're at, in the beginning stages of the third great awakening. Do you remember him saying that? And I think that's the same type, the same concept. We're going to enter into a time of great revival like this world has never seen. I believe that that's what the Bible promises, and I believe that's what we're going to experience. And I believe it'll be in our lifetime. The latter rain is, is about the Holy Spirit. Again, this is part of the Holy Spirit series of sermons that, that I've been doing. We're going to begin with James chapter 5, verse 7. This is where, where James makes reference to the latter rain. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. So he's saying this is something you need to be patient for, and he also makes reference to the coming of the Lord. So this is something that's going to happen right as or right before the Lord returns. He mentions patience. We need to be patient. Patience is, is really a manifestation of faith. If you're, if you're truly walking in faith, you will be patient. Because to, to not be patient, if you're not patient, that means you're doubting or you're in unbelief to a degree. Impatience to me is, a, is an indication of lacking faith, but patience is an indication that you, are, that you do have faith, that God, whatever God has promised, he will faithfully do what he has promised, and we just simply need to be patient until it manifests. And this specifically is talking about the coming of the Lord, but he's indicating that it's not going to happen until after the former reign and the latter reign. The former reign was... In the early Pentecost days, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the 120 that were in the upper room, basically the book of Acts covers the early rain, and the latter rain is similar events, but even greater, I believe, that are that's supposed to take place in our generation. Now, he gives the, the example of, or an illustration of the farmer. He says the farmer has to have patience until he receives both the former and the latter rain. You know, you can't plant seeds and expect a harvest immediately. In the Midwest, I grew up, part of my childhood was on a farm. I was never a farmer. No one in my family, no one in my immediate family were farmers, but we did live on a farm. And I observed a lot of hardworking farmers. I mean, actually, the town I spent a large portion of my childhood in was a town called Farmer City. So you can't really get much more farm oriented than that right so there were farmers all around there were cornfields bean fields animal farms there was a lot of, of farming going on and it seemed to me like farmers were the hardest workers there were they would get up before dawn and work hard way past sunset diligently working hard but all that hard work doesn't pay off immediately they have to have patience and eventually ultimately assuming they have a good harvest, it will pay off and they, they will reap the reward. So, so this is telling us that there is a latter rain coming, but you need to be patient for it. It's coming and I believe it's coming in our, in our lifetime. And 
really, I think his main point here is that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And just because there's a long period of time before he actually returns, don't lose your patience. Realize he's faithful to every promise. If he promised he's coming, he's coming. We believe it'll be in our lifetime, but even if it isn't, that's fine. We know he's coming. I, I think on the next slide I put, I give a little bit of a definition. It's not, it's not, I was planning on giving a more detailed definition, but I never got to it. But basically when, when I refer to the latter rain, and I believe when the Bible refers to the latter rain, it's talking about miracles and supernatural manifestations. We could say the gifts of the Spirit flowing. You remember Jesus said the works that I did, I did you can do also and, and even greater. And we're going to see scriptures that will say that the latter rain will be greater than the first. As powerful as that early rain was in the book of Acts, the latter rain will be even greater. And so I would say, you know, I put the rest of this here just basically to illustrate how powerful that early rain was. In the book of Acts, healing was flowing through Peter's shadow. So I think we can expect that. Can you say amen? Or say I don't believe you? <laughs> hopefully you don't say that but I mean if, if it's in the book of Acts and the latter rain is supposed to be greater than the former then why not healing flowing even through your shadow as it did with Peter and supernaturally translocating to another location from one spot to another spot as Philip did in Acts 8 so the I'm just giving that as examples of some tremendous I and mean, we know about all the healings and we know about other miracles that took place but these are a couple of really spectacular things that took place by the Spirit of God and why not today there, at least twice in the scripture twice in the Bible it tells us that he's the same yesterday today and forever he is God and he changes not he does not change so the same God of the supernatural is still the God of the supernatural in our generation the same God that demonstrated the former reign wants to demonstrate the latter rain, and I believe it'll be even greater. That previous verse that we were looking at in 1 Peter 5, could you put that one back for a minute? There's one more thing I wanted to point out, because this is in the context, really the whole chapter, really the whole book of James is really emphasizing faith and different characteristics of faith, and chapter 5 is emphasizing patience, and he's talking about being patient for the coming of the Lord. You know, there's the coming of the Lord or the Lord's return is something that a lot of people like to talk about. And I've heard people say that Jesus can't return until certain things take place. Like the, the one thing I've heard a lot, especially at the school that I was working at, that Jesus can't return until the temple is rebuilt. Have, it, have any of you heard that? Do any of you believe that? <laughs> My position is you are the temple. The temple has been rebuilt. All the way through the New Testament, it refers to us as the house of God. We, the church, are the temple of God. And even individually, it says you are the temple of God. So I would say if you're expecting the temple to be rebuilt, just look in the mirror. The temple has been rebuilt. He's still working on us for sure, but, he, but we are the temple of God. So I don't think that is a requirement before Jesus returns. I've heard other people say everything has been fulfilled so Jesus can return any second. Have any of you heard that? <laughs> and how many of you believe that? I would say there's one exception to that. There is one thing that must happen before Jesus returns. And I found at least four Old Testament references about the early and the latter rain. And the one thing that I think must happen before Jesus returns is the latter rain. And I just don't think we've seen it. We've seen supernatural revivals. We've seen, you know, the healing revivals of the 50s. And we've seen the rise of prophets and apostles and, and a lot of gifts of the Spirit. But I don't think we've seen the demonstration of the Spirit in the, to the same measure as it was in the book of Acts. So I would say Jesus won't return until the latter rain is fully in display. So let's look at a few scriptures in the Old Testament that, that foretell the latter rain. In Joel chapter 2, verse 23, it says, be, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down for you the, the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So there's a few things here I want to point out. First of all, he says, be glad, and he also says rejoice. So those are both 
synonyms to a degree, right? Be glad, rejoice. So in other words, God wants you to be happy. God doesn't want you to live your life here on earth depressed or doom and gloom and dealing with all kinds of, of issues. You know, he says, whatever, whatever it is you're going through, he says, cast your cares upon him because he takes care of you and he cares for you. So be glad, ye children of Zion, that's you. Rejoice in the Lord, your God, for he has given the former rain moderately. Now, this really kind of stuck out at me. When you take a look at the moving of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, does that look like it's moderate? <laughs> but compared to what the latter rain's going to be, he's saying all that book of Acts stuff, that was moderate. It's like he's saying you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> what the Spirit of God is going to do in our generation, I believe it'll be our generation, but in the last days before Jesus returns, will surpass all the book of Acts stuff. I would say the book of Acts at least times two. <laughs> Maybe more, but I believe he's saying that, that that early rain, that former rain, was moderate. But he's going to cause to come down on you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in, it says the first month, some translations say in one month. In other words, if you have all the rain of, of a year come down in one month, what, what's, what, is, what would you call that? A flood. <laughs> so I would say a flood is coming. <laughs> A flood of supernatural revival is coming. I think that, to me, that's what he's saying here. You're going to have all the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, all come down in one month. A flood is coming. A flood of revival, a flood of healings, salvations, spirit baptisms, and miracles. All kinds of great supernatural things are going to take place. This, of all the scriptures that I'm going to look at, I think this passage is probably the most well-known, but... There's a lot more than just this. But let's look at the next couple of verses, verses 24 and 25. This is still in the context of the latter rain, I believe. The floors will be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So first of all, he's saying here, your floors will be full of wheat. When you read prophetic scriptures, you have to realize that most things in prophetic scriptures are not literal. They, they are symbolic. So the, the floor is full of wheat. This is talking about God's word. God's word is the bread of life. So we are, to, we are to be full of the word of God. The vats overflow with wine and oil. What does wine and oil symbolize? I, I talked about this several weeks ago. Wine and oil are both symbols of the Holy Spirit. So the rain... Rain is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but the wine and the oil here are also symbols of the Holy Spirit. So, full of the wheat, I'm saying that's the word of God, overflowing with wine and oil, overflowing with the Holy Spirit, overflowing with the manifestations of the Spirit. You know, the manifestations, the gifts of the Spirit aren't to be just for Sunday. In fact, if you look at the book of Acts, it seems like the gifts of the Spirit were flowing more outside the church than inside the church. I think in your daily lives, when you're in your daily conversations, God may give you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom for somebody or a gift of healing. Be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit to, to guide you and lead you in your daily walk. Here at church also, but wherever you go, Monday through Saturday also, the Holy Spirit wants to, to guide you. He says he's going to restore the years that the locust ha has eaten. The years that the locust has eaten, or the, the worms, the different, mentions different kinds of worms. In other words, those are the fruitless years. Perhaps many of us have experienced what we might call fruitless years. <laughs> Sometimes I think back at my age, where did all the years go? I mean, it seems like they went just like that. And some years were more fruitful than others, but there were, certainly were some fruitless years. But, and this gets back to, the, to the, the illustration that Peter gave, I mean James gave, about the farmer. A farmer has to be patient to wait for the crop. But what if you put in all that labor, and I mentioned to you that farmers are the hardest workers I've known. You put in a lot of labor before sunrise to after sunset, day in, day out. Usually they work six days a week. Sometimes perhaps some of them even work seven days a week uh, during certain seasons of the year. What if you did all that labor and there's no harvest? Don't you think that would be wasted effort? <laughs> 
and you'd feel, you'd feel real bad. Well, a lot of us can't identify with that because we, we're not farmers, but we can identify with that type of thing, putting a lot of labor, a lot of effort into things, and it produces nothing. You know, perhaps a failed business venture or a bad investment or all kinds of things that we've done that just bore no fruit at all. But God promises restoration here. He says, I'm going to restore those years. He's promising restoration to you. No matter what it is that you may say the locust has eaten or the canker worms have eaten or the palmer worm, the caterpillars, they've eaten away at different things that I could have done or I tried to do, but it just didn't work out. And it can be very heartbreaking and devastating when you put a lot of labor into something and it, it just doesn't work out. So perhaps you feel that success and fruitfulness has been stolen from you, but God is promising restoration, I believe, in this verse. You know, all those Christless years, or, or perhaps all those years that you tried to live the Christian life out of self-effort instead of resting in the Holy Spirit. Whatever areas in your life seem to be lacking, he is promising restoration. And I don't think you have to wait for the latter rain <laughs> for the restoration, but we just need to allow him to direct our steps. Let's go on to the next two verses. In these two verses, I see five points for preparation. You ready to prepare for the latter rain? Here's five points, I think, in these two verses that should help us. Uh, I'm going to read through the whole two verses and then go back and, and hit each, each of the five points. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. First of all, he says, you shall eat in plenty. And spiritually speaking, I don't think he's talking about physically. It may imply that also. I mean, I think most of us eat plenty. <laughs> but I think he's talking about eating the word of God. He's talking about spiritually eating plenty of the word of God. You know, in our generation, there's no excuse for anyone to be ignorant of the word of God. I mean, it's everywhere. There's churches on every corner or in this building alone, there's half a dozen churches. <laughs> you know, churches are everywhere. And if you don't, if you're not able to get out to go to a church, churches are there's Christian television, Christian radio, Christian internet sites. So the word of God is going forth. It's flourishing everywhere. So if you want the word of God, if you want to eat in plenty, it's available. In our generation, like never before. I mean, there, there were times in, in history, like during the Dark Ages, where, and really before the printing press, very few people had a copy of the word of God. And if you, if you went to church, you weren't necessarily being taught the Word of God <laughs> in some of the churches back then, and even in many of the churches today. But now, in our generation, the Word of God is flourishing everywhere. You can't go without the Word of God if you want the Word of God. I mean, it's everywhere. So, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. So, I would say the first key or the first point for preparing for the latter rain is take advantage of that. Eat plenty of the Word of God. Not just on Sunday, if, if this is the only spiritual meal you get on Sunday morning, then you're probably starving spiritually. You know, you should eat, if you eat three physical meals a day, eat at least that many spiritual meals a day, I would say. But eat plenty of the Word of God and be satisfied. And the next point is, he says, and praise the name of the Lord your God. So the second point for preparation is praise Jesus. You know, I've noticed that the, the, the churches that really flow in the spiritual gifts, what do you think is one key factor among all those churches? They really know how to praise Jesus. Some of the, the churches that are really flowing in praise and worship are also flowing in spiritual gifts. So I think praising Jesus is important. If, you know, there, there's some people that have the attitude, well, I'll get to church for the sermon. But you should be at church for the praise and worship. The praise and worship is important. Now, I assume you spend time in your own houses and in your cars and wherever you are praising Jesus. I hope you are. Don't let this just be a Sunday thing for you either. The first point should be a daily thing. Praising Jesus should also be a daily thing. So that, that's the second point I see here. The third point is that phrase, 
and it's found in both verses. This is something that he says twice. I've, I've said repeatedly, if, and I know most of you have heard me say this, if God doesn't fill his pages with junk, he, just, he doesn't fill the pages of his book with wasted words, every word that's there is significant. It, ha it has a purpose. It has a point. But if he takes the time to repeat himself, don't you think he's really trying to emphasize that? God doesn't want you to be ashamed. In fact, there's a scripture in Romans where he says, believe upon the Lord and you shall not be ashamed. So he doesn't want you to be ashamed. I was, going to, I was going to ask, but I'm not going to. Have you ever been ashamed of the Lord? You know, I think that there are Christians that they've given their life to Christ, but for some reason they are, maybe they wouldn't use the word ashamed, but they're afraid to talk about Jesus to their friends. So don't be ashamed of Jesus. Certainly never be ashamed of the Holy Spirit. And there's, there's a lot of Christians, I've known Christians like this, who, who, you know, they'll talk about Jesus, but they don't want to talk about speaking in tongues or anything that has to do with the Holy Spirit. But he's saying that my people shall never be ashamed. This is something that we need to claim for ourselves if we're having an issue with this. I am not ashamed and I'm never going to be ashamed of the things of God, the, the things of, of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. I'll never be ashamed. And I think that's very important for us. And the fourth point is, he says, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. So Jesus is in our midst. And I, I believe the New Testament teaches that we are Israel. We are, the church is spiritual Israel. And in this context, I would say this is, this is applying to us. We are Israel. We are the, the true Israel of God. The church is. And he is in our midst. I mean, Jesus him, himself said that he would be there with you when there's just two or more gathered in his name. He's right there with us. And if, he's, if you've invited him into your life, he's with you already. So when we come together, we know that Jesus is right here in our midst. And the fifth point of the five points is in that last phrase, that next phrase, I mean, I am the Lord your God and none else. I was thinking about this. Why does he say this? I am the Lord your God. I mean, that would be sufficient just to say that, right? But why does he add and none else? I believe this is telling us that he wants you to be single-minded on him. He doesn't want you to be double-minded. You know, don't be double-minded. If the majority of our time and attention is on secular things, perhaps we're quenching the Holy Spirit. If we expect the supernatural, the great supernatural signs and wonders and spiritual gifts to manifest in our lives, we need to be single-minded, single-minded on Jesus, single-minded on our relationship with him, which is something that we see throughout, throughout the Bible and, and especially in the New Testament where he says, seek first his kingdom. But we need to be single-minded, focused on Jesus as our source and supply don't let the cares of this world, the cares of this world could easily distract us. I'm sure everyone here has experienced that where the cares of this world are earthly concerns, distract us and get our attention off of Jesus. But I think the, the way this is worded, I, I am the Lord your God and none else. He's wanting us to realize that, that he wants to be our singular focus on him. Oh, I think the next slide is a summary of those five, those five points. Eat the word of God. Praise Jesus, never be ashamed of Jesus or his Holy Spirit. Jesus in our midst, single-minded on Jesus. Five points for preparation from Joel 2, 26 and 27. All right, so let's go on to the next few verses. This is, this is where it really gets exciting, <laughs> where he's explaining what, he already mentioned the latter rain. He mentioned the former rain and the latter rain. And in verses 28 and 29, I believe this is where he kind of goes into detail as to what this former rain and latter rain should look like. It shall come to pass after, afterwards, well, after what? After those five points of preparation, I would say. It will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And upon your servants and upon your handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This is such an exciting passage of scripture because, well, for many reasons. First of all, He's doing the pouring out of the Spirit. It's not something that I have to try to do. He's doing the work. <laughs> He's pouring out His Spirit. And He says on 
on all flesh. And it says your sons and daughters shall prophesy. It doesn't just say your sons will prophesy. It says your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Ladies, don't, ever, don't let anyone ever tell you that God only uses men to lead churches or to, to operate in prophecy or preaching or anything like that. God uses women all the way through the Bible. And here he is emphasizing that he's going to use your sons and your daughters to prophesy. Gender is irrelevant as far as God is concerned, but age is also irrelevant. It says, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. So it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how young you are, God wants to use you. Do any, does God ever give you dreams or visions? Anybody here? I'm not going to ask if it's a dream or a vision because that might identify whether you're young or old. I, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But God wants to give you dreams and visions. And he, you know, don't quickly dismiss it. If, if you have a dream and you think God might be tr trying to say something to you, don't quickly dismiss it. You know, maybe God is trying to communicate something to you. And maybe there's symbolism, so it's hard to figure out what exactly the Lord's saying. But ponder it and ask the Lord to reveal it to you. And I'm sure he will. Oh, verse 29 also, servants and handmaids in those days. He was, he's going to pour out his spirit. So I'm, what I'm seeing here is gender isn't important to God, age isn't important to God, and economic status is not important to God. You know, even, even the servants and handmaids, he wants to pour out his spirit. Hallelujah. So Now Peter quotes this, so we're going to look at Peter's quote in Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit of God was being poured out on that day of Pentecost and people began to speak in tongues and, and prophesy and it says there was a great sound of, of the wind and there was fire on top of everybody's head. There was all kinds of great dynamic supernatural things taking place and some people came along and said, well, these guys are just drunk. And Peter says, these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day third hour of the day would be about nine in the morning but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel okay so he says this is that in other words he's referring back to what Joel had prophesied which we had just read and he's saying what Joel had prophesied about the early rain and the latter rain and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit this is that that Joel prophesied it was happening right then and then he quotes him he says and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. So Peter recognized this as what Joel was prophesying. So that's what that was. But that was only half of it in the book of Acts. That was the former rain. But remember, in an earlier verse, he said there's also going to be a latter rain. And that former rain that Peter was experiencing and the apostles were experiencing, that was the moderate former rain. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture tells us that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So there's at least three references if you, if you want to, to verify that that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Again, God doesn't repeat himself unless it's something he really wants you to know. But if he repeats himself, you really need to pay attention to what he's saying. Because this teaching, this idea of a latter rain, isn't only spoken about in Joel 2 and Acts 2 and where we began in James 5. There's also, there's at least three more references, and we'll go through these other three references somewhat briefly. But there's at least three other references where a latter rain is spoken of. And in Hosea 6.3, I think that's the next one. Okay. Ho Hosea 6.3, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us as the rain, as the latter rain and the former rain unto the earth. So one thing that must take place. I believe the one thing that must take place before Jesus returns is that latter rain. We saw the former rain, and for the past century, I suppose, we've seen a lot of supernatural events taking place in various churches, since Azusa Street, at least. 
we've seen a lot of moving of the Holy Spirit, but I don't think we've seen it to the degree that it, that it has been foretold. But people are going to be saved, spirit baptized, healed in great numbers. I believe signs, wonders, and spiritual gifts are going to flow in the church as well as on the streets as never before. The next reference I have is Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, where he says, Ask ye of the Lord in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain and everyone grass in the field. So what, what's he instructing us here? He says, ask. In the time of the latter rain, ask. Have, it, have any of us taken time to ask the Lord for the rain? Maybe we can add that to our prayer <laughs> on a regular basis. He says, ask for the rain in the time of the latter rain. And I believe we're entering into, as Greg Moore indicated, the uh, beginning stages of, uh, of a third great awakening was the way he called it. So it's in, we're in that season, so we, it's time to start asking. And he says the Lord will make bright clouds. Some translations translate that as lightning. There'll be lightning. And he'll give showers of rain and everyone grass in the field. The grass of the field, to me, that implies flourishing, fruitfulness, prosperity. But he says, ask for the rain. And one thing I see in this, it's like he's saying, like, like in Joel 2, he talked about being single-minded, focused on Jesus. I think he's talking that, about that here, Zechariah is, that we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to God. We need to ask him for the rain and keep our eyes focused on him. You know, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about that that we're not going to get into today, about keeping our eyes focused on him. When I was reading through this, when I was studying it, it kind of reminded me of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where he says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things will be added. So in other words, our eyes need to be focused on Jesus and his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't be, don't be focused on your own lack of righteousness. <laughs> Be focused on Jesus and his righteousness and all these things that he has promised will come to pass. Uh, in Colossians 3, Paul tells us to set our affections on things above. So in other words, our entire being should be focused, single-mindedly focused on Jesus, on his kingdom and the things of God, the Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Look to him, eyes focused on him and he'll bring the rain. And the final reference to the latter rain that... I have is Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 but it doesn't even mention latter rain <laughs> I think it's clear it's talking about the same thing but it uses a little bit different terminology he says the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former okay so instead of saying latter rain and former rain he's saying latter house and former house but he's it's the same thing okay so the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former saith the Lord of hosts and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory, when you think of glory, when I think of glory, I think of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is going to manifest his glory in this latter house. What's the house? What's the house of the Lord? You're the house of the Lord. So the Lord's going to manifest the glory of his presence, the manifestations of his spirit, in this latter house, us, greater than the former. So again, we, we think back at what took place in that former house, the early church, the, the book of Acts days, and he's saying the glory, the manifestations of the Spirit in this latter house will be much greater. Isn't that exciting? God has great things in store for you. And I think we can tap into them in our day because the gifts of the Spirit never did cease. I know that some denominations say the gifts of the Spirit ceased, but they really didn't. People ceased operating in them, but the, the gifts didn't cease. I share all this basically to encourage you, and I, you know, I the, re, just remember those five keys to preparation that I shared from Joel 2 verses 24 and 25, I think it was, and just indulge in the Word of God, indulge in, in the things of the Spirit, and keep your mind focused on him and expect these things to begin to manifest. Your name is beautiful. Hallelujah. This is Pastor Ken Miller at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, 
in the countryside area of Sterling, Virginia, I'd like to encourage you to join us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Again, it's Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150 in Sterling, Virginia. Our Sunday morning service is at 11 o'clock. Join us in person or watch us live streaming on Facebook. God bless you. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into our hearts and you changed our name. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into our hearts and gave us a new name. A couple of weeks ago, actually, been a month ago. I, I mentioned the latter rain. I shared a few verses on the latter rain, but I didn't really feel like I did that subject justice. So I'm going to revisit that and and hopefully go into a little bit more detail on what the latter rain is. Um, rain can be very refreshing, but it can also, if it's heavy enough, it can also do some damage. <laughs> and rain in scripture Rain symbolizes the moving of the Holy Spirit. I think probably everyone here is aware of that, that rain has to do with the, the Holy Spirit. It symbolizes, it really, to me, it symbolizes revival. When we talk about the early rain and the latter rain, it's talking about the, the moving of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to explain all that. But, you know, people predict, when we talk about eschatology or last things, the word eschatology just means the study of last things. When we study about, you know, people, you probably have heard different preachers say certain things must take place before Jesus can return. One thing I hear commonly, or I used to hear common uh, frequently, is that the temple has got to be rebuilt before Jesus returns. Have, it, have any of you ever heard that? And my position is the temple is rebuilt. We are the temple. <laughs> I mean, he's not finished with us, <laughs> in, in a sense. I mean, in a sense, he is, because it was finished 2,000 years ago. But, but we are the temple. If, the, if a temple is going to be rebuilt, just look in a mirror. So what must take place before Jesus can return? From my perspective, the way I interpret Scripture, and I believe this is correct, there's only one thing that must take place before Jesus can return, and that is the latter rain. We've seen sprinkles of the latter rain, but we haven't really seen it, I don't think, the way it is demonstrated in Scripture or the way that it is explained in Scripture. And I, I'll show you what I mean by that in James 5. And it is, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. The early and the latter rain. Now here, James is talking about patience in the context. The rest of that chapter, he's talking about patience. So he's speaking about a farmer. King James says husbandman, but most other translations use the word farmer. A farmer has to wait patiently. You can't, and everybody knows this, you can't plant seeds and expect to harvest the next day. There's patience that's involved in being a farmer. And I can't imagine, I mean, I grew up on a farm. I, I lived in, I mean, I actually grew up in a town called Farmer City. So how much more farmer can you get? <laughs> so, I mean, I was never a farmer, but, but I did live on a farm. But I know that farmers, the farmers that I knew anyway, were some of the hardest working people that, that you could meet. And they sometimes would get up before dawn and work past the sunset you know, just working, laboring all day with planting and cultivating and plowing and, and anything else that's involved in farming. And can you imagine doing, putting all that labor into it and then somehow there's no crop? Can you imagine putting all your labor into all that and there's no, no harvest? The one thing that I want you to see in the, in the area of patience is what is patience? Patience to me, patience is a manifestation of faith. And if you really believe that God's going to give you what he promised you, you will be patient. 
And if you're impatient, it's a sign of lacking in the area of faith. And don't get me wrong, I believe that if you're a believer, you have faith, but just because you have faith doesn't mean you're walking in faith. Okay, I hope you see the difference. But if you're, if you're impatient, that is a sign that you have stepped out of the faith realm and because doubt or fear or impatience is a sign of lacking confidence in, in the promises. So he says, wait patiently, brethren, wait patiently because Jesus is coming back soon. In the, in the context here, if you look at the whole context, he's talking about the, the return of Christ. Wait patiently because Jesus is coming back soon. Wait patiently because we have an eternal hope to hold on to. But it's, it's almost like Jesus or James is saying, just hang in there a little bit longer. Just hang in there a little bit longer. It won't be long now. Of course, he said that 2,000 years ago. <laughs> so how long is long? How, how soon is soon? We believe Jesus is returning in our lifetime, right? <laughs> But even if he doesn't, we know that his promises are true. So, so we have a hope that the world doesn't have. If you truly believe that, patience is effortless. I can understand people being impatient if they don't have the hope that we do, if they don't have the relationship with God, if they don't have the promises that we have to hold on to. You know, the scripture says twice, once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament, it says that God is not a man that he would lie or something. It's not worded exactly like that in Hebrews, but it's the same type of thing. That God is not a man that he should lie. I think it's in Hebrews where it says it's impossible for him to lie. So if it's impossible for him to lie, then just look at his promises. There's so many of them. They're countless. You know, the benefits that we have in, in the Christian faith, the promises that we have are so numerous. Why would we even think about doubting? Because he's not a man that he would lie. And the scripture says it's impossible for him to lie. The world doesn't have that hope. So I can understand them being fearful. I can understand them being doubtful and impatient. But because of the hope that we have in, and the promises that we have in this God that does not change, in this God that, that tells us at least twice that he doesn't lie, that means find a promise and stand on it. Find a promise and cling to it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Don't let anything talk you out of it. Don't let your circumstances talk you out of it, but cling to those promises. So the role that we have as believers in, in this context where he's saying wait patiently um, and he, he's talking, especially if you, if you were to look at verse 8, it's clear that he's talking about the fact that Jesus is going to return soon. So the role we have is faith and patience. That's our role, faith and patience. Faith and patience go hand in hand throughout Scripture because God faithfully does what he promised. But here, I, I want to reemphasize that rain here has a double meaning. In the context, it's talking about a farmer, or in, in this particular verse, he's talking about a farmer who... Ha he, who there's the former rain and there's the latter rain, and you need both rains. You need the early rain and you need the latter rain in order to get a good harvest. But rain has also, in Scripture, it's also symbolically talking about the Holy Spirit or the moving of the Holy Spirit. It's referring to a supernatural revival of the Holy Spirit on the earth. And we're going to look at some of those, those promises we're going to begin here and end here, but all the other scriptures we're going to look at are in the Old Testament, but they're prophesying things that are going to happen, I believe, in our generation. All right, so here we see the latter rain promise in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 is probably the most well-known, although we're going to look at a few others also. Be glad, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. I love this verse because, and I'm going to look at the next few verses too so you can see the context, but what I want you to see here is, all right, so there's the former rain and the latter rain. The former rain symbolically is referring to that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in th that we see in the book of Acts in that first century. And you, you remember at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 where there was tongues and there was uh, there were fire. There was fire. There was a wind, 
or it says the sound of a wind. It doesn't really say there was a wind, but the sound of a wind. And there was prophesying. People were prophesying in other people's languages, in languages they'd never heard. And it, as you go through the book of Acts, you see all kinds of things taking place. One thing that, that I like, that I'd like to see, frankly, is what Philip did in Acts chapter 8, where he was translocated from one spot to another spot. Can you imagine that happening? God wants you somewhere else. You don't have to plot and plan how to get there. He just sends you there right away. If it happened then, why not today? And yeah, there are testimonies of that happening to people. So, <laughs> so, so it be expecting supernatural things to take place. So the former rain is what we saw in the book of Acts. The latter rain is what's going to happen in our generation. I believe it's our generation. <laughs> I believe this is the last generation before Jesus returns. And in our generation, we can expect this latter rain. And what I really like about this is that he says, notice that, that Joel says that former rain was moderate. All that book of Acts stuff, he says that's moderate. It's like he's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. All that book of Acts stuff, all that supernatural, those supernatural things that were taking place in the book of Acts, don't believe the traditional churches that say, well, that was just for then. That was just f until the last apostle died. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> or it died off when, when the last apostle died. No, it didn't. Maybe that was the end of the former reign, but, but the, the gifts of the Spirit never ceased. The gifts of the Spirit are for every generation. But in the latter reign, the latter, the, this great outpouring that's to take place in our generation, the last generation before Christ returns, it's going to be a lot greater than what we see in the book of Acts. <laughs> that former reign was moderate. And I also like that those last two words, the first month. In some translations, or at least in one place, I found where it said in one month. Not necessarily the first month, but in one month. And what, it, what it's depicting, I believe, is that if you get all the rain for a full year to come, to, to come down in one month, that's going to be a flood, right? <laughs> so I think this is what he's saying. A flood is coming. It's not just a rain. It's a flood, a flood of revival. Now, what exactly that looks like, I don't know for sure, but I would say it's the book of Acts multiplied by at least something, <laughs> The, that book of Acts rain was moderate, and this, this latter rain is going to be a flood of revival. A flood is coming, and we need to believe that. So in, in the context of the second chapter of Joel, he's clearly talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at a few more verses so you can see this. That in the context, he talks about dreams and visions and prophesying and all kinds of things taking place, which is the moving of the Holy Spirit, or what we could call the reign of the Holy Spirit that's to come upon the, the earth. Verses 24 and 25. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore, restoration is part of this, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now, here we see wine and oil. Wine and oil are also symbols of the Holy Spirit. There'll be an overabundance of Holy Spirit activity. He's symbolized in the rain. He's symbolized in the wine. He's symbolized in the oil. The Holy Spirit is going to be moving mightily in this season, in this latter rain season. God is promising, among the other things, he's promising restoration. All those years that were, that were eaten, all those years that were taken away from you by the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. He's, he's promising restoration. What has, what has been stolen from you? What has been stolen from you? He's promising restoration. God is promising a restoration of all that the enemy has stolen from your life. Years, the locust hath eaten means fruitless years. A lot of hard work with no crop, like I was mentioning earlier. If a farmer works so hard from sunrise to sunset, before sunrise and after sunset, day after day after day, sometimes six or even seven days a week, and I knew farmers like that <laughs> back in central Illinois where I grew up. There were farmers that were working literally seven days a week, and 
they would get a lot of ridicule from the churchgoers saying, you, you got to go to church on Sunday. The reason your crop's not doing good is because you're not going to church on Sunday. Well, we're not going to put that kind of law on people. <laughs> but I'm just saying that to point out farmers are hard workers. And if they work all year long or all season, all summer long, all spring and summer, and they end up not getting a crop, can you imagine the, 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 the devastation of that? And many of you know what it is in, in, base, in business or a, a failed venture, a bad investment. You know, when you put a lot of either time or work or finances into something and then it's nothing, you know, it's quite a disappointment. It's like it's been stolen from you. But God is promising restoration. He's promising restoration. All the Christless years, <laughs> we could call those locust years. And all those years where you've tried to live the Christian life through self-effort, we could call those locust years. They were not nearly as productive as they could be. But he's promising restoration because God is on your side. The God of restoration is desiring to restore the areas that are lacking. The God of restoration will step in and restore all, those, all that's gone wrong in your past. He, he's the repairer of the past. He's the repairer of all things. Restoration and refreshing comes from learning to lean on the Holy Spirit, learning to trust the Holy Spirit, learning to follow his leading and let him direct your steps. So let's, let's go on. So the main thing I want you to see there is that part of this latter rain is restoration. Restoration from whatever the devil has stolen from you. Verses 26 and 27 and ye shall eat in plenty. Now, I believe that that means spiritually, but I think it also means physically. I think you're going to have, you're going to be prosperous. You're, it, keeping everything in a spiritual context, I think it, it is talking about the word of God is going to be flourishing. The word of God is going to be powerful. You're going to have, you're going to be satisfied spiritually with the word that's coming forth. But I think it could also mean in a natural realm too. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Notice that phrase. My people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. So the latter rain is a season of plenty spiritually but I believe also financially. And as I shared last week, that God, God is the God of plenty. He is the God of prosperity. He's the God of generosity. And where it mentions that I'm in the midst of Israel, I believe that's talking about us. We are spiritual Israel. We are, we are the spiritual Israel of the new covenant. And so he is in our midst. And notice also, it mentions in both of those verses, you shall never be ashamed. My people shall never be ashamed. And again, when God repeats himself, I think he's, he's placing a special emphasis on that. He does not want you to be ashamed. And if you are walking by the Spirit, you will not be ashamed. If you're being led by the Spirit, you will not be ashamed. Are you ever ashamed of your relationship with Christ? Are you ever ashamed of the Holy Spirit? How about this one? This is probably none of you, but are you ever ashamed of speaking in tongues? You know, I, I, I know Christians that know how to speak in tongues. They do speak in tongues, but, but it's almost like they're embarrassed to admit it. <laughs> but he says you're to never be ashamed. He says my people will never be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of what God is doing in your life in any way. Hallelujah. Verse 28. This is 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward. And this, by the way, before I read this, this is what Peter quoted. Peter quoted in Acts chapter 2, and he said, this is that which Joel prophesied. So all the things that were taking place in Acts chapter 2, and the crowd gathered around thinking these guys were just drunk <laughs> at 9 in the morning. The crowd gathered around to find out what was going on. There was a great commotion taking place in that upper room. And, you know, they apparently saw fire and they heard wind and, they all, and all kinds of things taking place. But Peter said, this is that which the prophet Joel prophesied. And it shall come to pass afterward 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So Peter quotes this. He identifies the current events of his day as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Joel was prophesying about. And I would say that's the former reign. The latter reign is still to come, but that's the former reign. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit was, was not poured out upon all. There was a few prophets, priests, and kings, and judges that were able to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was not poured out upon all. But under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is available for everybody. And this is a tremendous promise that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for everybody, for anybody and everybody. They're, they're available for all. You look at certain men of God or women of God that are moved, they move by the gifts of the Spirit so freely and you admire them perhaps, but that's available to you also. It's available to me. The gifts of the Spirit are available to each of us. And I really like this because this, this context, it tells you that age isn't important. He talks about the old men dreaming dreams, the young men seeing visions. So he wants to use the old and the young. So he doesn't want anyone to fill out. Gender isn't important. He says sons and daughters. He says servants and handmaids. So don't, <laughs> ladies, don't let anyone tell you that you have to be a man in order to preach the gospel. That's nonsense. I know a lot of traditional churches teach that. But this prophecy is for anybody and everybody that just believes it and acts upon it. So regardless of age, regardless of gender, and regardless of economic status, notice it says even your servants, if you have servants, but it doesn't say your servants, but it says the servants and the handmaids. So it's not just for the rich, it's for every every economic status. So so not just the the bosses, not just for the, the leaders in society, but even the servants and handmaids are going to have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? God pretty much includes everybody in these two verses. Well, that's, yeah, verses 28 and 29. So the, the work of the ministry is, is the responsibility for each and every member. It's not just for the pastor. You know, it should never be the pastor doing all the ministry. It should be everybody involved in one level or another. So, but God wants to rain down his presence upon each of us by his Holy Spirit. So that's as far as I want to go in Joel, but... From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life, Grace, and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. I got to have